<laughs> All right, everybody, welcome to this episode of uh, On Location with Sean and Marco, except Sean is not here. This is not Sean, pretty sure. This is Jeff White. It's not Sean, yeah. And uh, we are going to have a great conversation about uh, the many things that you do. I don't know if I should refer to you as a podcaster, investigative journalist, speaker. What, what do you prefer? I, I use them all, but uh, I guess <laughs> I guess journalist is the shorthand for all of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. So uh, we had the opportunity to talk uh, another time was for your first book. That's right, yeah, yeah. Prime.com, yeah. uh -huh. if I remember well. And uh, that actually, you can explain me if I got that right, it turned into a podcast yeah. on the BBC. Am exactly right, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of the chapters of Crime.com was about North Korea and how North Korea, of all places, became a computer hacking superpower. So of all places? Of all places. Well, most people don't have the internet in North <laughs> Korea. So, um, so I looked at the Sony hack, I looked at the Bangladesh Bank hack, um, and off the back of that, we turned that, that story, those stories about North Korea and all of the other accusations against North Korea into a BBC podcast called The Lazarus Heist, hence, hence the t-shirt. Love it. Um, and then I wrote a book also called The Lazarus Heist, which is everything that was in the podcast plus a bit more besides. And the story hasn't stopped there. The story just keeps going and going. And that's why there is another book. The, other, the next book that I'm putting out continues to tell the North Korean story. I, I, I thought it couldn't get even more weird or even more bizarre. <laughs> it gets weirder. It gets much, I, much weirder. I read some of the comment and some of the reviews and uh, yeah, they say it's very intricate. Yes. But before we get to that, for those that don't know who you are, mm -hmm. especially maybe here in the US, and yeah. uh, uh, a little background on how did you end up interested in this kind of... Uh, yeah. Topic. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I've been a, a journalist for quite a long time, 20 years or so. And um, I worked for a program, a TV news program in the UK called Channel 4 News, a very august program. And um, I covered technology for them. And at the time, we're talking about the era of the Apple uh, iPod launch. We did the iPad launch. And so tech was seen as being games and gadgets and not mm. very serious. And I started coming to events, not RSA, but similar events and seeing that computer hacking was something that was costing people money, that governments and intelligence agencies and the military were using to exert power in the world. And I thought, tech isn't an end of program funny story anymore. Tech is serious, very serious. And off the back of that, we had the anonymous movement, we had the Edward Snowden leaks, we had, again, Sony Pictures Entertainment hack, and all of the subsequent cybersecurity stories. So suddenly, it felt like I'd made a shrewd move to start covering cybersecurity. Right, it became something that it was really much connecting with society exactly. at every level, which yeah. is kind of like what interested me in cybersecurity. My background is not cybersecurity, yeah. it's more sociology, so I'm like, hmm, yeah. why are we talking about tech to tech yeah. in between tech people yeah. and not applying to society? So and you you decide to go pretty deep, though, into hmm. the crime of it. Yes, yeah. Uh, for me, um, the organized crime aspect of it's been really interesting. So what I generally look at is organized crime and technology and where those two things come together. And increasingly that's most organized crime as a technological aspect to it. So in my new book I've talked about cartel drug dealing, prostitution, child sexual abuse, some quite serious, very serious subjects. All of those crimes make money and they're all using technological means now to wash and to launder that money. It's all ending up in things like crypto and online banking and so on. So organized crime has moved very heavily into technology. The reason I like organized crime is, you know, you and I, we work for organizations and, and you know, they're legitimate, at least I hope they're legitimate, above the board organizations. <laughs> we don't know. Yeah, mostly. We yeah. don't talk about it. But, but the thing about that is, if something goes wrong, if they don't pay you, you can go to court, you can try and sue, you can call the police. You know, If you work for an organized criminal organization, well, if something goes wrong, you can't call the cops, say, oh, this drug gang didn't pay me off. So organized crime gangs have to have all of the features of bureaucracies and companies and so on. You have to have payroll and recruitment and bosses and so on. But none of it's got any underpinning of legitimacy. So they have to enforce contracts, they have to enforce agreements in different ways. Now, traditionally, that was violence. If you don't do what I say, I will break your legs. But these days, because so much organized crime is distributed, hacking is a global enterprise, you're not in the same country as the person you're working with. So you can't threaten them with violence, really. You've got to have some other way of getting the trust between criminals going. 
And that's what I find fascinating. That's organized crime, is how can I trust you, buddy, because you're a crook and so am I. How do we trust each other? Hmm. And the, and the main, I'm thinking like ransomware, easy, right? Yeah. You can do it everywhere you want. Exactly. So uh, before we, we get into the book and the ransomware, we had a, a conversation not too long ago with someone that we're actually talking about how cyber crime is actually a use branding and marketing to promote themselves mm. in the dark web, mm. but also to be considered a reputable oh, yeah. company yeah. where if you do as they say, yeah. they will do as they promise. Exactly, yeah. And if they don't, nobody's going to pay them anymore. So Sorry. tell me about this yeah. kind of like psychology behind yeah. it. So this has been really interesting. So a lot of the cybercrime forums that I used to visit in my research, that I still visit my research now, getting trust between users has been really important. There was one forum I went on where they had an escrow system, so if I tried to buy stolen data from someone, I could put the money into the escrow that was run by the website, and once I received the, the stolen data, then the website would release the money to the, the seller. Now obviously the website takes a cut as the escrow, but the whole point of that was to get trust between users. I, for example, tried to buy some stolen credit card data, a very small amount, I should say, I wasn't, you know, it wasn't my money I was spending, it was the, the news organization's money. But just as a test, the person on the other side ripped me off, stole my Bitcoin and didn't give me the data. So I wrote to the forum administrator, obviously wasn't identifying myself as a journalist, and I said, oh, somebody ripped me off, they didn't supply. And so the forum administrator replied and said, I'm very sorry you've had this experience, we've blocked that person, and uh, please use our escrow service in the future. So you have always had in these forums trust networks building up. Star ratings are very important, so most dark web marketplaces will have star ratings for vendors. If you rip somebody off, you get a bad rating, same as with eBay, a similar system to eBay. What's been interesting is that that trustworthiness thing has now had to move into victims. If you are the subject of a ransomware attack, if your data is encrypted and you're being told pay up and we will decrypt your data, how do I trust you? Mm -hmm. So these ransomware gangs have A, had to give people what they call proof of life, some of their data back to show that they can do that. But also, they've had to, they're very aware, these ransomware gangs, of when you Google them, what comes up. Because they know if you're hit by ransomware gang X, you're gonna go on Google and say, well, who are they? And if what comes up is a list of don't pay, they won't give you your data back, well, you're not gonna pay. So they're Googling themselves, they're making sure their reputation is really good. If you pay, we will give you your right. data. It's a reputation system, which again, not just being Italian, might make me think about the mafia being the state in within the state, mm. where the state doesn't provide to you, yeah. we provide to you. You can exactly trust that. us. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it's really, really tough. But now we're talking about uh, technology yeah. and how it's used. And yeah. in your yeah. last book, you talk about it's called Rinsed, yeah. and you talk about how recycling money and, and all the crazy way that it's doing with technology? Yes, yeah, yeah. So, um, the new book I've got coming out about money laundering and how technology is influencing this business of money laundering. And again, money laundering is a really interesting business. For a start, without money laundering, um, there, really, there is no organized crime. You, you can't commit the crime if you can't pull your money out. So this has always been, yeah. like yeah. way before, oh, yeah. with the human, we had yeah. crime, we had money laundering. Yeah, you've got to pull, the, if, unless you can get the money out and get it in a usable form, there's no point committing the crime, all these crimes right. are- Right, what are, are you gonna do in. with that bank that you robbed? Exactly, <laughs> so, the, so but the, for money launderers, again, they need to do a good job, they need to do a regular, reliable job and not rip people off. Because if they do rip somebody off, your name is mud. Nobody's going to work with you again. So again, for money launderers, reputation's really important. And I find it interesting that the criminals have these really intricate and well-developed trust networks that they rely on. Because they have to, because they can't go to the courts, they can't go to the police, they can't go to the government. All they've got is trust. And so trust in that community is, is really, really pivotal. Give me some example of what you talk about in the book. I mean, do you talk about different industries yeah. in within the industry, like different kind of crime? Exactly that. So in the book I've tried to I've tried to describe what money laundering is. Now there are three basic steps in any money laundering job. First step is what they call placement. So imagine you sell some drugs on the street, you get cash, a million pounds of cash. You've got to somehow get that into a bank or some kind of financial in institute. 
so that nobody steals it from you. You've got a, a million pounds in cash, it's vulnerable. Second stage is what they call layering, where you take the money you've put in and you mix it around with other money. So that even if the cops can chase the money to the bank, they can't chase it through the bank into the other accounts. That's second stage. Third stage is what they call integration, which is where you take the money, which is now divorced of any connection to the crime. It's clean money. And what you do is you try and buy things with it. You might invest it in some art or a, a nice apartment or a, a lovely car. You know, you get to enjoy your money. So I've described each of those stages in the book, and then I've described how technology is changing each of those steps. And I've looked at things like uh, cartel drug dealing. Um, I've looked at things like prostitution gangs who use that sort of met methodology. Child sexual abuse gangs also using it. But I've also looked at fraudsters, and I've also returned to the North Korean example and some of the astonishing hacks attributed to North Korea, including a raid on a video game called Axie Infinity in 2022, during which they stole $625 million. Million. The biggest theft of all time, I'm gonna peg that out. And, and again, of course, they've stolen all this money, it was in the form of cryptocurrency. How are you gonna extricate it? Well, you have to have launderers, and again, the launderers help them out. So the role of uh, Bitcoin and digital currency in this, has it made things easier? Yes and no. Okay. It's a mixed picture. So, good question, right? Yeah, yeah, very good question. <laughs> so cryptocurrency, and we should say, I'm going to use the phrase crypto assets, which is a bit of a jargony type term, but we're talking about Bitcoin, but we're also talking now about things like NFTs, yeah. um, in-game currency, you know, Roblox and Robux and stuff like that. Um, the problem with all of that, the advantages are it's very quick to move around, you can move it internationally, it's instant transfers without having to use a bank. Great. The problem is those crypto assets, the Bitcoins, etc., move across blockchain technology. So the ledger is public. So when right. I send you yeah. a Bitcoin, it's public. So on the one hand, that is a bad idea for criminals because you can see where the money moves and you can track it. However, if cryptocurrency was a really big problem for criminals, and if it was really bad to use, if it was all traceable, they wouldn't be using it. And they are, they're using it in spades. So what's happening is some cryptocurrency attacks are tracked and traceable and they recover the money. But a whole bunch of cryptocurrency attacks, they never get back the money. The, the two examples that are perfect are the hack on Colonial Pipeline in the US, huge oil, oil and gas company. Now they paid, I think it was $4 million in ransom and the government, the US government got involved because it's critical national infrastructure. They managed to claw back quite a lot of that money. A few months later, another company called JBS Meat, a big meat supplier, they get hacked, they pay $11 million ransom, it's never seen again. Mm. So it's not the case that all Bitcoin and crypto is traceable and you get it all back, absolutely not. Those two cases show you the two extremes really, what can happen. So you know, obviously they wouldn't play with it, as you said, if it was as traceable as the way, exactly, yeah, the way yeah. they say it. The worry, by the way, though, for, for, for cyber criminals, I think, is at the moment, a lot of it's anonymous and you can get away with it. We have seen cases, notably Silk Road, the big dark net marketplace that got shut down. Money was stolen from Silk Road by cyber criminals. And in the last couple of years, I think it is, we've seen the police trace that money and prosecute those individuals. So it could be that today's cyber criminals who think they're very safe using crypto, in eight years, 10 years time, 15 years time, they get a knock at the door because the police have managed to work out what's going on. It's interesting. It's possible. So this is what I'm thinking, like we are at a cybersecurity event, yeah. one of the largest, if not the largest of the world. And we talk about innovation and, and how competition bring innovation, but also there is the never ending battle between good and evil, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? There's the bad guys, they're gonna use AI to yeah. do the bad things that they do and they're very innovative. Yeah. And that innovation will fire yeah. the good guys, yeah. most of the people here, I'm assuming, yeah. to make yeah. the next step. Yeah. And yeah. so I'm wondering, so the cyber crime that you look at and the money laundering or the first book where you look at other kind of cyber yeah. crime, do you see it as a, I'm being provocative here, as a, as a good evil, like a needed evil in, in society ah. to kind of 
progress. And, <laughs> I don't know, I'm so, going philosophical here. It's interesting. There is an argument that a lot of technic technological developments happen during times of war, and whilst we don't like war, uh, yeah. it does, you know, lots of inventions that we get come about as part of war. Look, no, I, 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 I would... There has never been a society without crime, right? As, as yeah. soon as people have possessions, somebody else wanted the possessions. You know, there will never be a society without crime. Um, a, a friend of mine, a contact of mine, is a gardener, and he always says, if you're a good gardener, you know you'll never have a garden without any weeds in it. But you, so you can never get rid of all the weeds, but if you don't try, you end up with just overrun with weeds. So that's the idea, is what's an acceptable level of cyberpunk? Right, 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 right. What I will say is interesting is that... Um, you talk about cyber criminals using AI. There are, as we've heard at this conference, there are signs and evidence that that is happening. What I will say is this, the cyber criminals have what I would call the, what the attacker's dividend. And the attacker's dividend is simply this, that if you have great defenses, do I need fantastic weapons to attack you? No, I just need to know where the holes in your defenses are. Right, right, yeah. So for example, again, going back to money laundering, which is the, the subject of the new book, um, there are artificial intelligence tools that can spot suspicious transactions. So if I'm trying to launder money and I try and launder more than, let's say, $10,000, the alarm triggers and, and my account gets blocked or whatever. Now, as an attacker, do I need to develop an AI system that gets around that? No. All I need to do is make sure my transactions are $9,999. As long as I know what your AI system is spotting, I can slip in under the radar. You're, play, I don't need you're to playing the algorithm. Exactly. Uh -huh. And that's, that's my worry is that, you know, the more technology, the more AI we put in, the more the attackers will think, well, yeah, I see what your AI is doing and I'll just go in around the side, which is what yeah. hackers do. It's an adversarial battle. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. yeah. All right, so we're running out of time here. We'd like to know the question that I usually ask to any, any author of a book. Who did you have in mind <laughs> when you wrote the book? Now, they normally said, this book is for everybody. Yeah, I understand yeah. that. I already know <laughs> that. But when you were writing, like, were you were you thinking more practitioners, yeah. everyday people? Well, the person I have in mind, the person I always have in mind when I write the book, when I actually come to writing it and writing the sentences and putting those those words together and the words on the page, is my mum. Okay. My mum should be able to read every one of my books and understand everything that's in there. Nice. Now I will say this to my mum: she does read my books and she does try. She doesn't necessarily remember it all, but if I say to her, did you understand? It says, yes, I understood it. However, that's the pat answer. The real answer is that every author who's writing a book needs to identify their core markets. Every author wants their book to just you know, fly off the shelves like JK Rowling or whatever. Truth is, you're gonna have certain audiences that are interested. For this book, it's about money laundering. Obviously, one target market is cybersecurity, cybersecurity people kind of people at this conference. Second type is financial crime people. So you're talking about banks, insurance companies and stuff. And the third group is crypto, cryptocurrency people. So again, anybody who's into the, not just Bitcoin, but other things like NFTs and so on. So for me, those were the three sort of target markets, if you like, that I, I think might be interesting. And I would say that if you made it understandable, uh, it's for everybody that is interested in learning a little bit more about yeah. what this entire system is. Yeah. So. I mean, what I found interesting when I thought about doing a book about money laundering was it's quite similar to cybercrime and cybersecurity. The general public, they know money laundering's there. They want to understand it. They've seen Ozark, for example, that great TV series. But it's complicated and it's dry and it's geeky. So I wanted to do for money laundering what I've done for cybercrime, which is to explain it in a way that's dramatic and powerful and has victims and villains and, and give people a sort of soft, juicy way to get into this subject. So I hope what I've done with Rince, the new book, does for money laundering what I've tried to do for cybersecurity uh, as an industry. Well, that's great. Good luck with that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to listen to your podcast as well because I've been staring at your t-shirt the whole time. Available. Advertising works. Wherever you get your podcasts. <laughs> I love that. Awesome. Jeff, thank you so much for stopping by. Thank you. And hopefully we'll see each other in London not too long from now. Sounds good. Fantastic. Right. Good to see Take you. Take care. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. We're done here.